All right, hello everyone. This is a special episode, special as in because it's an old episode. So if you've already listened to this, no need to replay. But anyways, as the show grows, I assume most people haven't listened to old episodes. I thought this one was really good. This is the first from the vault of the collection. And this one I thought was actually good enough to even just my... um, kind of rambling along with it i thought it was i thought it worked (laughs) so i'm just gonna play the whole episode again entirely uh so hopefully you guys enjoy this again this is the recap from last year's opening weekend and yeah i thought it was low-key kbk was probably my favorite race of last year so i hope everybody enjoys this one i know i enjoyed writing this one recording this one even editing this one too so this was uh yeah i thought this is great totally thought it's worth reposting for for anybody that hasn't uh hasn't heard so hopefully hope you guys enjoy thanks for listening cycling for me has never been about the bikes they've only ever been the prerequisite tool I do not see just a bike race, I see riders on heroic journeys and warriors doing battle. At one point cycling was the most popular sport in Europe because newspapers told magnificent tales about epic races and crafted the great champions into legends. But with the advent of television, cycling lost some of its mystique and that golden age of journalism and narration has perished. So now let us try to return some romance to the beautiful sport. Let us praise and give glory to phenomenal performances to be remembered for decades to come. Let us dwell on the moments that inspire and move us. Let us chronicle the rise and fall of heroes. Let us chart these life-changing journeys, these cycling odysseys. All right, welcome back to another episode of Cycling Odysseys. I'm your host, Patrick Santino. Okay, we're recapping opening weekend today. (laughs) Oh, my God. It was hilariously unbelievable. This is why you have to watch every race and cycling just in case it's one of the great races that you don't want to miss. You rue the day when you miss Colonel Brussels Colonel this weekend. <laughs> As you're about to hear. Seriously, I, if you didn't see Amla, usually that's the one to more more so watch than Kerna, but this, this year Kerna blew it out of the water, and that's pretty unbelievable because – Omlop was also unbelievable itself. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything until I get into it here with the the main part of the show. It's also really long today, so I I actually got I I angled it so that I could give it the full treatment with this uh, with this piece coming up. But if you didn't see Omlop, it's still worth a watch. But Kerna, if you only have time, watch Kerna. You're fair, fair warned that I'm I'm about to spoil the whole thing for you here. So highly recommend watching that if you haven't that was a we're talking very close to a 10 out of 10 race and i don't say that lightly so with that let's jump into it let me give my thoughts on the whole thing and then i'll wrap it up with a few more thoughts The showmen light up the opening weekend of reduced bunch sprints. Pick whatever sport you like and think about what makes the greatest showmen in that realm. Surely they are exciting to watch, but why are they exciting to watch? It is not only because they are very athletically gifted, and it is not only because they exude confidence while swaggering around and showing off that extreme athletic talent. What makes the greatest showman the greatest showman is that they write the script for every game, match, event, or race they take part in. This is how they transform themselves into larger-than-life characters who dazzle the fans in unforgettable ways. On this opening weekend in Belgium, two of cycling superstars dictated how the race would play out. And in a complete power move, neither even factored in winning to their calculations. Amla Pet Newsblad and Kerner Brussels Kern are prestigious classics to win. To win one of them not only starts someone's season off right, for most riders the season is already a success the instant they cross the line in victory. But as you shall hear, for the titans of the sport, that was of little interest. 
Alas, it was a balmy, sunny, probably 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 5 to 10 degrees Celsius. Such inappropriate weather for the opening weekend. Alas, it seems the winter warlocks have already gone into summer hibernation. But surely it was of little matter at Omlop Het Newsblad. Always a tough race that tires out the legs. Yes, that is how it started off. The cobbled bergs were doing their proper damage as usual. With 70 kilometers still to go, the field was slowly starting to shrink as the domestiques and pretenders were crashing or running out of gas. It was running like a typical Flemish cobbled classic, and with 43 kilometers to go, the peloton ascended the Molenberg cobbled climb with the early breakaway less than a minute up the road. It was no surprise to see Matteo Trentin of UAE and three quick steps pushing the pace. Over the top, as is the way of the classics, 10 or so riders had a gap. Greg Van Avermaet of AG2R, the reigning Olympic champion for an extra year with his gold helmet, was there. Nearly man Sepp Van Marke was there. Matteo Trentin was there. A Kofidis rider, a Quebec rider, a Bingo rider, and three quick steps were there. One of the quick steps was Zdenek Stebar, the former cyclocross world champion. Another was the talented Davide Bellarini, who had already won two stages this year at the Tour de la Provence. And yes, yes, it had to be... One of the quick step riders was, of course, the reigning world champion wearing his rainbow jersey, our beloved musketeer, Julian Alaphilippe. Dear reader or listener, you should know where the story is going by now. The group of 10 or so caught the early breakaway of five riders, had got a 15 or 20 second gap over what remained of the peloton behind, and though it wasn't much, over the next couple of kilometers, all viewers came around to declare this would probably be a big selection for the day. The group was strong and working well together. Only Groupama's Kevin Genitz, the champion of Luxembourg, and the newest grenadier, Tom Pidcock, were able to bridge across to the strong front group in the midst of lifting off for the rest of the race. In only his second cobbled classic ever, his debut was only last fall at the Tour of Flanders, where you all remember he crashed out. Julian Alaphilippe, the musketeer, was captaining the leading group of Amla Pet Newsblad, the mini Tour of Flanders. Surely, if this group kept working well together, they could pry open a more sizable gap to stay away from the rest of the peloton to the Muir, at some 18 kilometers from the finish, where they could make a further and final selection. With 34 kilometers to go, they had a 30-second gap. Amla Pet Newsblad was coming to a fine boil despite the nice weather. And then, with 32 kilometers to go, our musketeer tore up the typical script. He attacked on the Berendries climb, and no one could go with him. With his arm sleeves rolled down, sunglasses hiding any emotion in his eyes, Al Philippe rode away seemingly comfortable on his beautiful specialized world's painted bicycle. Julian Al Philippe was striking out on the attack and cruising. Within two kilometers, he had a 16 second gap over the strong chasing group he had just left. Now in this moment, of course, of course we were all excited to see one of our favorite riders out on the attack. But with 32 kilometers to go, surely this was a long way to solo, Julian. Have you attacked too early? Did you want others to go with you? Or are you just feeling that good? Only Tom Pidcock even had the energy to attempt to attack up to you. But he could not find separation. Yes, Julian Alphilippe was showing some flying form and giving the people a show. And now the question must be asked, what exactly is Julian Alphilippe's quick step job description for this race? This is actually a perennially weird, thorny question in cycling. Surely many riders show up at this race with no ambition to win the race themselves. Instead, they are there to work for others. In what other sport do the majority of competing athletes not try to win the competition they are competing in? But this is the case in every cycling race across the calendar. And so, why was Julian Alaphilippe here? To win the race for Quick Step? Perhaps. But clearly, that wasn't enough for Alaphilippe. Clearly, Alaphilippe's best chance to win would be to have stayed with that strong group. Shared the workload so that they stayed away until the mirror, where they can then prove who has the strongest legs for the day. Instead, Al Philippe decided to expend way more energy because instead of rotating with 10 men and getting 9 rotations of shelter from the wind, he took it all upon himself. 
and without Al-Philippe, what remained of the peloton was clawing their way back to the 10 or so group Al-Philippe left. And with 21 kilometers to go, even Al-Philippe's gap to the group of 10 or so was coming back down. Surely we all realized Al-Philippe was not here to win. He was here to put in a big day. If he carried a 32 kilometer solo breakaway to the line and took the victory, awesome, great. Bonus points for him. If he put on a show and won some more fans too, that'd also be awesome. But what he was doing was just selfishly trying to get some hard race kilometers in the legs for later objectives. In a way, it was a little disrespectful to the race. It was disrespectful because with 18 kilometers, as he was coming into this town of Gerensbergen, the reckless showman Julian Alphilippe was caught not only by his strong 10 or so man chasing group, but also the remaining peloton behind at the very foot of the Muir. And then came the strange finish that has not been seen at Amlop Het Newsblad for 27 years. Over the Muir van Gerensbergen, the most famous climb in Belgium, the Kapel Muir, the race regrouped instead of shattering apart. Only Ineos's Johnny Mascon found some separation over the top. Everyone else strung out, but the elastic never snapped and some 50 riders formed a peloton once more. And in a few kilometers time, Moscon was caught at the top of the Bosberg, the final climb of the day. With 13 kilometers of net downhill left, it looked like Amla Pet Newsblad, the mini tour of Flanders, would be decided in a 50-man sprint finish. Yes, this race has not ended in a bunch sprint for 27 years. At this point, Quickstep had the numbers and they were prepared to leave it to a sprint. They controlled the front and set a relentless pace that discouraged any attacks in order to keep the group together. And despite his showman antics already, Alaphilippe did his part for the team into the very last kilometer to help hold it together. And having already made the earlier selection and gotten his season off to a hot start with those two Provence stages and just having the contagious quick step winning ethos davide bellerini finished off the day for quick step and manhandled the sprint where he won by four or five bike lengths julian alphilippe was the strongest rider in this race he could have won this race if he had just waited until the traditional and ultimate spot to make a winning move on the capel mirror instead he rewrote the script in order to put in a hard day's work and maybe even give the people a show. His antics led to a bunch sprint won by a teammate in a race that has forgotten what a bunch is. And despite that, he was completely upstaged on Sunday at Colonel Brussels Colonel. <laughs> despite having seen the musketeer Julian Alphilippe put on an inexplicably reckless show the day before at Omlop, we were still all at a loss with what we were seeing with 85 kilometers to go at Kerno Brussels Kerno KBK. We knew he was trying to get some hard miles in his legs when he went to the UAE Tour. He made the most of his one day of racing when he won a hard sprint after a long day of brutal crosswind action. But a staff member tested positive for COVID and the team was sent home. He did not start Omlop. But he became the favorite for Kerna as soon as it was announced he'd be taking part. We all figured, surely he has the quality and talent to be there in the sprint at the end. He'll have the endurance to do a good finish and might even be the fastest guy here on paper outright anyways. But still, all of us were scratching our heads as we saw Matthew Vanderpool of Alpes and Phoenix reigning and four times the cyclocross world champion on the attack on one of the little climbs with the Ecuadorian grenadier Jonathan Novarez, who had won a hilly stage of the Giro d'Italia last year as the only man that even bothered to link up with him. There were eight or so riders three minutes up the road comprising the early break of the day. What the hell was Vanderpool playing at trying to bridge up to them? The broadcast had not even started but 10 minutes ago. What was the plan here? Truly, I recall my thoughts in the moment. What the hell is he doing? What an idiot. I could understand if he wanted to try this long range crab with 50 kilometers to go. From there, I'd give him a chance, but this is too far. This is dumb and upsetting because I want to see him actually take a shot at winning. He's just ruining his chances to win at this point. And then I paused and thought for a moment. Subconsciously, I had just learned the lesson Al Philippe had taught us yesterday about showmanship and putting in a big day. I did not consciously know it yet, but I did verbally say, 
Eh, whatever. Let's have some fun with it. Let's see what he can do. So, before we go on about how Vanderpool tears up the script of this race, let's praise another player. Not only was I surprised to see Jonathan Navarez on the attack with Vanderpool, I was surprised to see him in the race. <laughs> Ecuador is a country that gets its name because it sits on the equator, a place known for tropical weather and sun. And furthermore, the Ecuadorians are to the Colombians like the Canadians or Kiwis are to the Americans or Australians. The Colombians and the rest of the South Americans are mostly known for their climbing prowess and have zero results to speak of in the cobbled classics. What are they supposed to know of racing in the harsh north of Belgium? Now, the stage of the Giro Navarra's won last year was horrendous with biblical amounts of rain. But still, this morning, if I had looked over Ineos's lineup, I would have assumed they had one spot left and they made all the South American climbers draw straws to see who would be stuck filling it. And Navarra's had drawn the shortest straw. But here he was, riding with Matthew Vanderpool in his Dutch champion's jersey, inexplicably trying to bridge a three-minute gap to the early breakaway of the day with 85 kilometers to go. What was going through Navarre's head as he rode on with this oh-so-talented one? Did the Ineos DS in the car say, Oh, Johnny, make sure our team's represented in any moves that go up the road here. That is actually a logical thought in theory. But the two-man composition of chasers had nothing logical about it in practice. The tall, big-shouldered Dutch race favorite and a small South American climber made for such a strange pairing, and I absolutely loved it. Vanderpool literally looked like Achilles, a giant among men on the battlefield, and Navarez today looked like his trusty aide and friend Patroclus wingmanning his captain on a new adventure. Vanderpool could not even get a proper draft off him. But if Julian Alphilippe had taught us anything from yesterday, Vanderpool didn't care about getting a draft today. Yes, he'd like to win, and he would try. But he was more so here to put in a hard day for the week of racing he was robbed of when his team was booted from the UAE Tour. Just as Alphilippe used Omlop as training, now it was Vanderpool's turn to do the same at Kerner Brussels Kerner. The only, only other explanation I can think of for this ludicrous scene is the most outlandish of all, and yet there is definitely truth to it. Apparently, in the past, Vanderpool has had a problem of getting too bored in long road races before things heat up in the exciting finales. Surely, he is a one-hour cycle crosser at heart. With 70 kilometers to go, Vanderpool and Navarez were already only 75 seconds down on the day's early breakaway, and 75 seconds ahead of the peloton behind. With 65 kilometers to go, Vanderpool and Navarez were only 45 seconds behind the early day breakaway, and now 90 seconds ahead of the peloton. The reckless madman plan was working. Surely soon they would make the junction with the early break. At the top of the Eau de Quermont, one of the hardest and most famous cobbled climbs in Belgium, with about 60 kilometers to go, Vanderpool and Navarez caught what was left of the original break with the peloton two minutes behind. Phase one of the madman plan was complete. On the Odi Quermont, behind selections were being made at the peloton. Jesper Stuyven of Trek Segafredo kicked off the action, but John Dagenkolb of Lado Sidal looked better than he has in years. And Greg Van Avermaet with his gold helmet was there too, and Oliver Nossen, his friend and training partner and AG2R teammate. Tish Benut of DSM, Quicksteps Asgreen in the Danish champion's jersey, and more than 20 others were chasing hard. With 58 kilometers to go, they were only 75 seconds behind Vanderpool's front group. Now the finale was really begun. With 55 kilometers to go, it was time to enact phase two of the madman plan, shed the dead weight. Kerner Brussels Kerna is a full 200 kilometer day. Having been on the front all day, most of the guys' legs in the early break were screaming by the time Vanderpool bridged up to them. Many would not help him make it to the finish, so why not shell out many of them who could not aid him in his quest? But Vanderpool kept looking back over his shoulder before attacking, and he was clearly itching to attack. But what was he waiting for? His newfound friend, the grenadier Jonathan Navarez, his full accomplice in the madman's plan. 
So on the Kloisberg, the very last proper climb of the day, Vanderpool ratcheted up the pace. It wasn't even a full tilt attack, and Navarez came to his wheel subliminally knowing the plan already, and only Johannes Vindeberg of the small Norwegian UNOX team could keep pace with them. For a pro Conti second division rider like Vindeberg, this was the best shop window he could ask for to find early world tour suitors for the next season. But behind the other favorites were all forming an elite group of chasers only 52 seconds back. Surely things were getting tight. The madman's plan was turning into a big ask as we always knew it was. By 52 kilometers, the gap was only 45 seconds to the elite group of chasing favorites behind. Meanwhile, up front, two riders from the early break had clawed their way back into the leading trio of Vanderpool, Navarez, and Vindeberg. The two riders were Patrick Gamper of Bora Hans Groa and Archim Zakharov of Astana Premier Tech. And if the day couldn't get stranger, Vanderpool turned around to welcome them both each personally to the group. What was he saying to them? Surely he must have spoken with them and expected them to aid the madman's plan. Surely he must have impressed upon them that if they did not aid in the escape, he would attack them again once more. Surely this is what he said because Gampner and Zakharov immediately started sharing the pace. It was a comical scene and it shall be remembered. Now, the reason all four of these riders happily worked with Vanderpool, who they were sure to lose to in a sprint, was because a top five result in a major classic would be a great result for all four of these men. With 50 kilometers to go, the gap was only 41 seconds. Yes, surely this would be a big ask for this group to stay away all the way to Kerna. And yet, with 42 kilometers to go, the gap had stabilized and was even back up to 50 seconds. The madman's plan was getting a second wind, and every single viewer was loving the moment, chuckling at the hilarity of what they couldn't believe to be seeing. Yes, this was an ideal sprinter's cobbled classic. A small group of strong escapees up front, surely already very tired from their more excessive early efforts than the chasers behind. The chasers who had saved more energy sitting behind in the draft of other riders and only showed themselves at need, now finally kicking into high gear themselves to bring back the men up front. This escape and chaser dynamic developed a third wrinkle as well. A third group had formed behind to chase back on to the more elite second group. But what this third group lacked in quality, it backed up for in quantity. Surely it lacked in quality for the strongest men besides Vanderpool were in the second group on the road, having proven the strongest over the climbs where the Peloton broke up. And then the bane of Pelotons in Belgium hit. The Quantius third group was ravaged by crosswinds over an exposed field, whittling it down into only the most elite men of that group. Yes, it is days like these where the classics receive their name. This continued for some time. Vanderpool and his loyal four, the main favorites in a group of 20 or so behind, and a third group of 10 or 15 more minor favorites and top domestiques in a third group who had not yet given up the fight. With 25 kilometers to go, Vanderpool's leading five had a tenuous 23 second gap over the second group and only a 53 second gap over the third. Surely this was the definition of a finely balanced race if ever there was one. Touch and go, we say, touch and go. Even that third group was not out of it. If they could catch the second group, the two groups would about double in size and thus potentially double in firepower to bring back the mighty Vanderpool and his makeshift teammates up front. Touch and go, truly, it was touch and go. It is races like these that need to be shown to the people who understand nothing about cycling. It is races like these that showcase the sport well, and we can be thankful for mighty ones like Julian Alphilippe and Matthew Vanderpool who have a knack of providing us with such spectacles. We all remember Vanderpool's 2019 Amstel Gold finish. It was engraved in the heart of every cycling fan. On the road, he punched his ticket into the club all the way back then. But it wasn't really until today that he finally received the key card in his mailbox after two years of them getting lost in the mail. The key card to the Makes Your Day Club. Surely it took so long to arrive because Vanderpool has the pesky caveat that it is only every one of his road wins that makes our day. 
The key card does not work whenever he wins a minor non-round triple digit cross race. But here we are, reveling in the beauty of bike racing as Matthew Vanderpool, one of the sport's greatest showmen, spoiled us by putting his talents to more entertaining than strategically reasonable uses. They rode through the city streets of Courtrike signifying they were close to the finishing line. But of course, as tradition in this race, there would be one pass through the finish before a final lap of 16 kilometers. And the finely balanced race became much more interesting when finally, with 17 kilometers to go, the third chasing group got within a stone's throw of the second group. And then in the second group, Greg Van Avermaet, the Olympic champion, made that third group work for the junction by putting in a surge on the front to keep his second group away, make the third group do the maximum work to catch back on. Meanwhile, with 16 kilometers to go, Vanderpool and his leading group passed through the finish line to begin the final lap. But with Van Avermaet's surge, the gap between the first and second groups was only some 10 seconds, 12 at most, I kid you not. Though the last kilometer seemed to be on the quiet suburban or village roads of Kerna, the final lap would take the riders back into the city streets of Courtrike before rounding back to the finish line they had just crossed in Kerna. Ten seconds, Vanderpool and companions nervously kept looking over their shoulders and could see the shades of the sunglasses of the chasers behind. And yet still they did not give in, like the Trojans who did not lay down their arms. Yes, still the five kept the good cooperation. A top five would be a great result for these four assisting Vanderpool. And meanwhile behind, the beautiful game theory equalizer in bike racing was taking place to string out the suspense. No one in that second chasing group wanted to be the man to spend the last bit of energy to finally catch the leading five. Leave it to someone else. Yes, game theory, a prisoner's dilemma. No one does the final chasing because it would benefit all, but hinder the one to do the final chasing. And while that second group was being cagey about finishing off the job, that third group behind finally caught on and swelled their ranks with 11 kilometers to go. And thus the complexion was changed once more. Vanderpool and his four men in the lead, with a now group of some 40 strong, only 10 seconds behind. And yet, they were weaving right and left on the city streets of Courtrike. No longer were the groups on the same straight stretch of road. And with eight kilometers to go, by Jove, the gap of the two groups was up to 17 seconds. The Courtright city streets were giving this madman plan its fifth or sixth live of the day. Was Vanderpool about to go two for two in road races he's attended this season? Was he about to follow up his UAE crosswinds win with a Belgian classic that no one thought he would even attend a week later? He was getting lucky because behind, the now big group had no cohesion and could not mount the chase. But the final roads were suburban and village straight wide boulevards. Even a few sections of open space were exposed to the dangerous crosswinds. Still, with six kilometers to go, the gap was 22 seconds. Vanderpool, Matthew Vanderpool, was about to pull off another classics win fully deserving of the name. Oh, it was too good to be true. And thus, yes, the madman plan was all too good to be true. With four kilometers to go, the gap was still 20 seconds, but then the attacks finally came from the large chasing group. Groupama's Stefan Kuhn, Bahrain's Hausler, and Quicksteps Asgreen ripped off and launched Cape Canaveral rocket attacks. No one could get separation, but they ate up Vanderpool's and his group's 20 second gap. Attack after attack led to their downfall. With 1.5 kilometers to go, the hilarious madman plan came to an end as Vanderpool and his group was caught. But there was no time for handshakes with his new friends to commemorate a good try. Vanderpool slotted right into the chasing pack, ready to try his hand in the sprint despite being out in the wind for some 80 kilometers already. I say this with the most admiration possible. Could we expect nothing less from this man? Surely any that had seen 2019 Amstel Gold even knew we could not count him out to pull off this tallest of order sprints. He slotted in for the last K and had to hope it just opened back up for him. They took the last turn. Whatever lead out men were left came to the front. We could see Vanderpool in the mix for the sprint, but he was too far back and too boxed in. It was way too much to ask, as we all knew. Trek Segafredo's Mads Pedersen, the former world champion, won the sprint, a rider we had not seen all day. Credit to him. He rode a smart race and took a great victory for his team. 
but Mad's win was an afterthought compared to Vanderpool's performance. I think we all know Vanderpool could have rode Mad's race if he really wanted to, but Vanderpool rewrote the script so extensively today we didn't even care about the winner. This was a race that put a smile on our faces that will not fade for three or four days because we couldn't believe the hilarious madman plan Matthew Vanderpool and his unexpected accomplice Jonathan Navarez came within a mile of pulling off. It was impressive and beloved. It is another anecdotal proof of why we always watch cycling. When you have superstars like Julian Alphilippe the Musketeer or Matthew Vanderpool the Madman in the race, you never know what antics and heroics they might strum up. Yes, I said at the start, on this opening weekend, these two showmen were bold enough to not even make winning their top priority. Both got in a hard day's racing to serve them better for bigger objectives to come. And we got another story thread to add to the sagas of these living legends' careers. And these are the tales that shall make us chuckle for days and years to come as we look back on their outlandish unbelievability. All right, so as I said, total power move, total power move. Julian Alphilippe and Matthew Vanderpool did not actually care about opening weekend enough that they wanted to win. They would rather just put in a good day's racing than win. I'm up at Newsblatter, Kern versus Kern. Oh, my God. Like, Kern, I can mildly understand for Vanderpool, but I don't know what Alphilippe was thinking. He could have left it to the mirror, and then he could have definitely won. <laughs> I'm a lot, but news flat. But he clearly wasn't there, and he had confidence in his teammate. Which that David D. Bellarini, I gotta say, that guy, he's a stud. Because he made that select group that Al Philippe kind of formed with Matteo Trentin uh, with 42 kilometers to go. He made that group, you know, and it's like, oh, I thought this guy was kind of like a Alberto Hodge kind of sprinter that they got. But no, I mean, like, he can sprint, and I mean, yeah, he can get over a climb in the cobbles. That guy. Man, Italy with him, Ghana, I mean, they're talking about other youngsters that are going to be like Grand Tour talents. It's like Italy, yeah, they're having a rise of a new generation potentially because, I mean, that Ballerini, he owned that sprint too. He owned that sprint. But, you know, the highlight of the day was actually Julian Alphilippe just <laughs> throwing away the script to have that day end in a sprint for the first time in 27 years, you know? So like anybody that's new that listened to my, uh, description of I'm up at Newsblad, they probably think I sound like an idiot and that, you know, this race, oh, this, you know, Patrick just got this wrong. He's leading me wrong. You know, it's like, uh, you could be right that I have foolish aspects and everything, but it's not because I expect I'm up at Newsblad to, and in a very small group sprinting it out. That race usually ends that way. Seriously, this is the first time literally in my lifetime that it ended in a bunch sprint. That was ridiculous. <laughs> How did the mirror not separate them? You know why? It's because of the good weather. I said we want crappy weather here. I said it. This is why This is the, usually it's the crappy weather that actually gives people a chance at Kerno. And then Vanderpool just rewrote the script of that one too. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. I I talked about them both, but the Vanderpool. <laughs> That's the ultimate compliment that you can pay to a race. Is that for the next literally three or four days, I'm gonna have a smile just thinking, man, Vanderpool almost went Colonel Brussels Colonel with an 85 kilometer attack with Jonathan Navarez. <laughs> like, what was he doing? <laughs> How did that almost work? They came within a mile of making it work. That's hilarious. How? D what are they doing? <laughs> oh my gosh. That's see. That's why cycling is great. I mean, I feel like I would hope this one kind of is a good representative. You can send this to people that are non-cycling fans, and they would start to appreciate cycling more. Like, why, why are you such a weirdo that always watches all this crap? It's like, yeah, it's for days like this. This is why you watch. You don't know when these days are coming up. And <laughs> like, that was 
so hilarious. I was so engrossed that I will laugh at that for the next number of days. And then f for a very long time, I will remember this day itself and just say, man, that was a good race day. That day, uh, if it, I mean, it definitely moved me because, I mean, it's just, it's just hilarious to think about. And it will always be hilarious to think about how Vanderpool almost pulled that one off. Oh, my gosh. Seriously, when I say living legends, this is what it's all about. Alaphilippe and Vanderpool. Those guys, oh my gosh, just what are they not capable of? They can just do whatever they want. And I mean it when I said like, you know, these are the showmen. They wrote the script. They wrote the script and it was not the normal script. It changed the whole way the race was run. I mean, it's just, it's not quite unbelievable because we just saw it and, and they've done this kind of stuff before, but it's just, you have to love it. You have to love these guys. I mean, I said it, I said it in there. Vanderpool, yeah, he, I mean, there's just no denying it. I've been trying not to, I've actually been trying to deny it and trying to give him, not give him his key card, but on the road, Vanderpool is part of the club. The club, the Makes Your Day club, it is the third or fourth coolest club ever to be a part of. The only clubs cooler than being part of the Makes Your Day club, because it's a very elite club, is the five-time tour winners club which there's only four people in it right now, Eddie Merckx, Jacques Anquetil, Bernardino, and Miguel Indurain. Lance screwed up, uh, so he's not in it, and Chris Froome's trying to get into it. And then the only other club cooler than that is, I would have to say, the, uh, the people that have landed on the moon. Only 12 men can say they've walked on the moon. That's probably a more elite club than the five-time Tour Winners Club and then the Makes Your Day Club of Cycling Superstars, which only has about four and a half names in it right now. So, yeah, that's uh, those are the exclusive clubs out there that everybody should aspire to be a part of, I have to say. So congrats to the, the guys that are in them. Well earned, obviously. Well earned. Um, and yeah, with that, this is a long one. <laughs> I don't want to keep rambling because I gotta still clip this all together. So, <laughs> so follow me on Twitter, Cycling Odysseys. You can read the blog post, cyclingodysseys.com. You can send me an email, cyclingodysseys at gmail.com. I'm, I'll definitely look at it, probably respond, probably even bring it up on the show, whatever it is. Please send uh please yeah please subscribe to the show leave a five-star review because i'll read it out and yeah with that thanks for listening everybody vive la ciclisma